okay, if you checked uh, earlier in your program, you know that this is an open source love story in three acts. And like any good three act play, we're going to start with the dramatis personae, a listing of the characters. So first, this is Peppercorn. Peppercorn is one of your user's dogs. And like any good dog owner, immediately Peppercorn's user went to all of their web services and changed all of their passwords to Peppercorn. This is Mallory. Mallory is an attacker. We will come back to her shortly. And this is me. My name is TJ Shook. I'm on the internet everywhere as my name without the dots and spaces, Twitter, GitHub, etc. cetera. Uh, I work at Harvest. We are the makers of the world's best time tracking software. You can check us out at getharvest.com. Uh, if you do anything where you charge money for your time, if you work for an agency or a consultancy or do freelance, you should check it out. Uh, I'm also here with the European contingent of harvesters, uh, Vlad up top from Macedonia and Yoshka on the bottom from Germany. So if you see any of us wearing a Harvest t-shirt, you can ask us about it. And if any of this is interesting to you or you just uh, want to check it out, we're hiring. Um, we are hiring all across the world. So we're headquartered in New York where I am from, but we have people around the globe and we're hiring in technical and non-technical positions. So if you know anyone that's looking, you can do that. But notable for this talk, I am not a security expert. Uh, there are people who are real security experts who get paid a lot of money to know a lot about many more topics than I know about. And if you have true fundamental security issues, you should hire one of them. Uh, but by virtue of the fact that at Harvest we have customers and we have users, we have to be security experts because ignorance is not an excuse. If there is a breach, we can't just say we didn't know any better. That's Inex inexcusable. So I am not a security expert, but I have to be, and you kind of do too. So let's, let's learn a little bit. So back to Mallory. Her attack is an interesting one because good security is about layers. You should have application level security. You should protect against things like uh, SQL injection, S XSS, CSRF. Um, you should have infrastructure level security. You should have a secure data center. You should have physical firewalls. You should update your bash installation. Um, but to truly assess any individual layer of the security stack, we have to assume that all the other ones have failed. So we have to assume that this works. We have to assume that Mallory can just run her script and get a database dump of our users table. So knowing that and knowing that we still have to authenticate our users, what can we do? So the easiest option is to just store passwords in plain text. We have our users table, we have their email address and their passwords, and then when they come in, we can check if they match and let them in. This is obviously bad, and no one here is doing it, correct? Correct, anyone want to admit? <laughs> All right, um, someone here is doing it, and they're doing it because they have reasons. They work on an internal app, so it doesn't matter, or their website is just a place where you can rank animated GIFs, so if their password got leaked, no big deal, people can just rank GIFs on their behalf. But it's bad because users reuse passwords. So even though your GIF ranking site has Peppercorn as one of your users' passwords, an attacker will get that and immediately go to Gmail and try that, and go to Facebook and try it, and go to all the banking websites and try it. And every individual service that they get into becomes another deeper avenue for a more elaborate attack against other services, because now they can authenticate using those other services with other ones. So it is bad to store these plain text passwords, we now know. Uh, so we need some way to obfuscate the data in this dump so that if Mallory runs her script and gets these passwords, she cannot use them. The easiest way is just to encrypt them using some thing to obfuscate the data. This is using a very secure encryption scheme called ROT13, ROT13, a Caesar cipher with a key of 13. You take all of the letters and you ship them by 13. So an A becomes an N, a B becomes an O, a C becomes a P, and so on. Uh, the important thing here is that this doesn't have to be something as simple as this. It could be DES3, AES256, any known encryption scheme. But the important detail is that they are reversible if you have the key. Here, the key is 13. If you know 13, you can unencrypt it and get the plain text value. With the other encryption schemes, there is similarly a key. And that key lives somewhere. It's either in your application code or on your server. And since the attacker already has access to your infrastructure, they presumably already have access to your key as well. And it's important to remember that an attacker could be an employee. Um, if there was a dump leaked of your database, if you have a large enough organization, it's possible that you could have a malicious actor inside of your organization that would then leak that key 
to make all of those things unencryptable. So encryption is reversible. It's uh, obfuscated data, but can be reversed back to the plain text. Hashing is irreversible. So that's a good bit of vocabulary to remember when you're talking about how to treat these passwords. So when you hash a value like peppercorn, you get some output. If you hash secret1234, you get some output again. But if you have some output, there's no function you can apply by design and definition that will get you the input again. Additionally, hashing is deterministic. This is important for our authentication flow because when a user logs in for the first time with their password of peppercorn, we get the output. And when they come back every time, the output of peppercorn is the same, the output of peppercorn is the same. So that's another important thing. It's also important that it's deterministic, but not obviously so. So when you hash peppercorn twice, you get the same value both times. But if you trivially change the input, so for instance, capitalizing peppercorn, the output is wildly different. And if your output is trivially different, the least significant bit here is off by one, the input is, again, wildly different. So there's no good way to kind of use that deterministic nature to find other ones. So here's an example of our uh, users table again, but now with all of these uh, passwords hashed. This is using MD5 just because that is the shortest output, so it's easiest to fit on a slide. But everything here is, uh, also applies to other hashing algorithms like SHA-1. So this is good. We can't go backwards now, so our passwords are safe. But there is a problem, and that problem is that hashing is deterministic. This is a double-edged sword. Because the hash of peppercorn is always the same, the hash of peppercorn is always the same. And that introduces the notion of rainbow tables. Now, there are three important things to note here. First of all, this slide is awesome. It's the best ever been made. <laughs> oh, you wait. Second. I've already turned it into an animated GIF for you that I will tweet out later so you can use it all the time. <laughs> third, <laughs> third, we are technically not going to talk about rainbow tables. We are technically talking about lookup tables, which is, uh, it is a rainbow table with a chain of length one is a way of thinking of it. Uh, rainbow tables and lookup tables are often conflated in literature, particularly uh, amateur literature on the internet, so it's good to know the phrase. And people are often referring to lookup tables. And the ways that you combat them are the same. But if I agreed to talk about lookup tables, this would be my slide. So instead, you get this. <laughs> but you have to know that we're talking about lookup tables. So from this user's table database dump, we have this list of hashes. So what we can do is, if we are an attacker, we can have this lookup table where we just take a dictionary of phrases and hash all of them, and then we just keep that sitting around. And then we can look up using the hash to get that reverse uh, value. It's not a function of going backwards, but it is a way to look up what the original value could be. As a proof of concept, using this uh, database dump here, we can use the world's most convenient lookup table, which is Google. If you just take any MD5 hash and drop it into Google, you don't even have to leave the results page. <laughs> it will just tell you what that probably is. So we need some way to render these pre-computed tables that are easily downloaded across the internet uh, obsolete. And the easiest way is to change all the inputs. So if we take peppercorn and we know that this is the output and we know that this output is in lookup tables all across the internet, we can just change it in some way so that now we have a different hash. And we know that this is like our secret string that we keep in our app code that we append to all of the passwords. And now they all have a little bit of entropy added to them. And then now, if we check our lookup table, there's no record. That hash has never been pre-computed anywhere on the internet. So we solve password security. It's great. It's easy. <laughs> we clap too soon. So that's true. An attacker can't look up those values in a pre-existing table. But they can generate new tables trivially. Um, and again, they can get that altering scheme from our app code or from a malicious employee, because again, they have already uh, breached our security. Uh, on this MacBook Air, which no one really considers a powerhouse of a machine, I can calculate 13 million SHA-1s per second. So if you had a list of, let's say, 25 million uh, dictionary words, you could calculate the hash of all of those in two seconds. And if you had to make a new one because there was this you know, trivial change that people added to make those tables obsolete, it would only take me another two seconds to regenerate that table, and the attack is the same. For example, 
This is what happened in Harvest. By happened, I mean I did it. We did not suffer a security breach. But we had the same thing that we described. We had this globally salted SHA-1 scheme for authenticating passwords, where your password would come in, we had this little bit of secrecy in the app code that we would then append to it, SHA-1 it, and that was how we uh, kept our passwords. Knowing that this was wrong, I decided, before anyone else would, as just a proof of concept, and honestly, I was bored one day, to try to do the attack. So I spent some time poking around doing some research, and there are freely available programs that you can download e very easily, and they're not too hard to use. Hashcat is one. It's what I used because I found it first. John the Ripper is another popular one that you can install via Homebrew. So again, none of this is complicated. It's easy to do. Uh, you also need a word list. Those are also freely available. If you just Google like you know, uh, password dictionary, you can find a couple of them and then push them all together and get 25 million in five minutes. So I did that. And there was Peppercorn, right in the middle of 80,000 other Harvest passwords. And it took me 87 seconds to get them all. In less than a minute and a half, I had 80,000 passwords. Uh, that's not even the majority of our users, but it's enough to do a lot of damage. And if I decided to spend longer than a minute and a half, I could probably get significantly more. Uh, additionally, by the way, for any Harvest users out here, I did my best to keep all of this data anonymous, so I ultimately just got a list of words. I don't really know who they correlated to. So it's also important to note that out of that attack, I got these passwords. That first one is kind of that leet speak substitution style thing that's very popular among people because it's easy to understand and easy to remember. But it's good to remember also that these programs are good. They know this trick, and they can take your word list and automatically swap out I's for ones and threes for E's. The middle one also seems like a pretty good password. That seems like a random string that wouldn't be in something like that until you look at your keyboard. And if you look at the QWERTY layout of a keyboard, that's just like a hardware hack. They're just marching along keys. The third one, I don't even know. I have no idea why that's in there. It's, there's no good reason that I could figure out. I couldn't find it anywhere. It's probably just by virtue of its length. It's not very long, so it's just a random string that could be calculated quickly. But again, it's, it's not enough to think that you can do a simple trick like this, because those simple tricks are also known by these programs and these attackers. So that brings us to the concept of true salting. Before, uh, you might have called that a salt because it seemed easy to call it that, but it wasn't really because we were using like a global salt that was on every password. So we can do a per password salt. So instead of saying peppercorn with this global salt, we can say peppercorn with the global salt, but then anyone else that comes in with a different password, we use a different salt. And you store this alongside it in the database. It is not a particularly secure piece of information. It's really just there to add that randomness. Knowing it will not really help the attacker much. So that's where you keep it. Uh, I got rid of the email column just to save space on the slide. You would still have that to look them up. And very random salts uh, help to avoid users having the same hash. Uh, earlier today, we saw this quote. And doing true uh, random salts for every user helps avoid this problem. By having enough randomness, if two people have the same password of peppercorn, their likelihood of having the same hash output is unlikely and particularly more common passwords like password or password one, or whatever the weakest password that your system will accept, you probably have multiple users with a similar password. This keeps them from having the same hash, and by cracking one, you don't crack all of them immediately. And with this system of salts per password, we now, instead of having to regenerate the table one time, we have to regenerate it n times. For every individual user, for what that salt is, we have to regenerate our table. And so that's pretty good. That gets us pretty far. But unfortunately, that's pretty good for 1976. And in fact, in 1976, in Unix's Crypt 3, that's exactly what it did. And the reason they did that was because modern hardware at the time could calculate four hashes per second. But today, we have these. This is an AMD AX7990. It's a GPU. They cost about $1,000. So it's pretty affordable for anyone that really wants to carry out an attack in a systematic way. They could get a couple of these. My MacBook Air that could calculate 13 million SHA-1s a second, this can calculate 1.5 billion SHA-1s a second. So now we're back to the same problem. Generating that one table for all of the users took me two seconds, but generating one lookup table per user using a GPU is feasible again, because now they're so fast and easy to create. 
the reason that this problem exists is because most of these hashing algorithms, SHA-1, MD5, they weren't designed for password security. They were designed for effectively file integrity. They're checksums. When you put in an input, an output should come out. So in our case, it was peppercorn in, output out, peppercorn in again, same output out. But you could also do Moby Dick in, the entire novel, output out, Moby Dick in, output out. And then you could do things like on a network transfer or a transfer across the internet, make sure you have the same thing on both sides. Because we don't want to slow down things like file transfers, we have these algorithms that are intentionally designed to be very, very fast. That's a good thing, usually. But for password security, it's not. So in 1999, Niels Provost and David Matsieris published a paper about future adaptable password schemes. And what they came up with was bcrypt. Now, bcrypt has all of the goodies that we've talked about already. It's a one-way hash. It's pre-image resistant. It's deterministic. It has built-in per-password salts, which is also nice that we don't have to deal with salts anymore. They just come along for the ride. But there are two additional things that make it very good for us. One is the underlying cipher which is xblowfish. It's based on blowfish, which is notoriously expensive to set up. But this, the EKS stands for expensive key schedule. It's even more expensive to get started. So before you can get going, just the, the boot process of getting everything going takes some time and takes some memory. It's memory intensive, which is good because GPUs typically don't come with an excess of memory, just computational power. Uh, more importantly, though, than the underlying cipher is this notion of an adaptive cost. It was even in the title of the paper it was so important. So let's, again, look at our database dump. This is our users table with now a collection of bcrypt digests. You'll see that the salt table is gone, again, because it's built in. So if we look at a digest, we can uh, investigate the anatomy of a digest. First of all, ignore the dollar signs. They're just delimiters. They're just there to keep all the fields separate. This last field here is the actual checksum. That's the output of the hash. Um, it's a 192-bit number encoded in a modified base 64. And then right to the left of it, that's the salt. So we don't have to worry about storing salts because they're just a part of the digest stored right in there. It's 128-bit salt, too, so you have a decent amount of randomness, the same base 64 encoding there. Uh, far to the left is this 2A. All that really is is an identifier. It just means this digest is bcrypt. Uh, 2x and 2y also signify bcrypt. Uh, I think 1a is uh, the iterated MD5, but that just comes from like the old you know, Etsy password style of storing passwords and knowing what they are so you can have more than one in one place. But most interesting to us is this second field, and that's the cost. And so what that means is if we take bcrypt and we use it to hash peppercorn with a cost of 10, we get some output. And if we take bcrypt and we hash peppercorn again with a cost of 10, we get some other output. But we know that it would be different because of salting. We already learned about that. And if we take bcrypt and do it with a cost of 14, we get a third output. And you can see right there in the digest is that cost of 14. None of this really matters much until you look at how long it took to do each of these. The first one took about 0.06 seconds on my laptop. The second one took about 0.06 seconds. And the third one took just north of a second. So by using that cost value, we can sort of march it forward with time. So if we determine that a cost of 10 or 11 or 12 is good for us today, two years from now, we can use a cost of 14, 15, or 16, and that will make this checking take longer and longer, and therefore it's take longer and longer for an attacker to do as well. So we can now battle that hardware march along with our computational complexity march. Uh, all of these are on my computer currently. Um, you kind of have to choose the cost a little bit uh, with a gut feeling, depending on your particular case. Uh, it, it will add this amount of time anytime you do a password authentication. So if you just log in one time to your web app and you do the authentication then and you set a session or whatever, it's probably good to have a higher cost just because you can afford it in your, your sign-in flow. If you add a half a second to that, no one's really going to notice. But if you support something like basic auth where a password comes every single time, you're going to add a half second to every single API request, so you might not want to use that high of a cost or just move over to something like OAuth 2. So before, the attack on the Harvest database dump that I took took 87 seconds to get 80,000 passwords. That same attack using bcrypt would take 84,000 years. So that's a pretty good improvement to make it no longer feasible. And so bcrypt is kind of the sweet spot between this usability and security. And it's nice for us because there's a Ruby library that we will look at shortly. Some of you are ahead of the class, and you're just sitting there on your high horses, just wanting to ask a question about PBKDF2 or a script, and say, well, what about this? It's just as good. And that's fine. You're probably right. 
Uh, I don't agree with you for very esoteric reasons, but you're very probably correct. And in fact, those are supported by most things that have these strict requirements. So if you're doing US government contract work, you actually have to use PBKDF2 because it's the only approved one. Um, but if you already know that, you're good. If you're already using them, you don't have to change. If you want to talk about the finer points, find me later. So we now have had this attack on our own database. How can we fix it? We need to convert all of these passwords, but we need the plain text version to do that. If we already have the plain text version, if you're in the first step, it's easy. Just kind of run a one-shot script to go through them all and convert them all to bcrypt. Otherwise, we need to kind of hook into our current authentication scheme, because that's the only time we get the plain text password. So if we consider that this is our old hashing scheme where we're trying to authenticate, plain text password comes in. If it matches with the digest we have after hashing the incoming, we just return the user object, otherwise nil. We want to get to here, where we are using bcrypt to do the same thing. Uh, very astute readers in here will notice the double equals and think that that might mean that I lied to you earlier, that bcrypt is in fact reversible, because we're taking a digest here and passing it into this thing and then comparing it with this double equals against this plain text password. That's actually not true. It's, uh, you know, the double equals is not commutative. This isn't math, it's code. So bcrypt Ruby overrides the double equals operator and defines it to actually do this comparison. Uh, I think this is kind of a, an unfortunate design decision, and I keep meaning to change it. But uh, it, it, I've seen confusion about it before in other pull requests, so it's just a good thing to know when you're using it. So the way that we can do it is just, as part of our auth flow, just kind of do a little pre-filter to convert. So when we come in, uh, unless we suc uh, successfully convert our old password hash to bcrypt, uh, then <laughs> just return out fail. Uh, if we do, then just auth with bcrypt. And in that password uh, conversion function, we can just see that if it's already a bcrypt hash, bcrypt provides this valid hash method, if it is, then just go back, true, we're fine. If it's not, just do it in place. First check to make sure that it matches, that it's the actual correct password. Update it in place, we're great. I know this code works, because this is what we use on Harvest. We kind of put this in there to, over time, automatically convert these passwords. And this is what happened. These are our users who have bcrypt hash uh, passwords. And this is about two and a half weeks of natural conversion. You can see there's a big spike up front as like all the daily users and all of our apps that use basic auth like authenticated in. And then there's a slow trickle as your weekly users come in, but we're getting better and better. We needed some way to fill the gap. And uh, for those people that weren't logging in, there's no real way we can force them because we don't know their plain text password, except I do. I know 80,000 of them. So I just re-white hat attacked our database, but this time with conversion in mind, and that got us a lot more. <laughs> this got, <laughs> thanks. <coughs> this got us most of the way there. <coughs> Excuse me. This got us most of the way there. We still had a few remaining ones. For those, we just reset their password and send them an email, just letting them know what happened. It wasn't that many, and we got literally zero complaints. So if you're scared about it because you have to send an email that says, hey, we need you to update your password, it's not that scary. Most people won't mind. There is one downside to using bcrypt, and that's because it's an expensive algorithm, it is an expensive algorithm. So this is our CPU utilization across all of our servers after we launched it. It doubled. It went from 12% to about 25%. Uh, there was a big spike up front as you know, that first spike happened. There's a couple reasons for this. Uh, for us particularly, we still support basic auth, and we have a lot of people using it. So that kind of increases the load, because more people are using uh, OAuth, or I'm sorry, uh, bcrypt for their uh, requests. But this is still well within the realm of acceptability. So it's not truly a problem, but it is a thing to be aware of. So, in a three-act play, act one is exposition. That's where you get all the backstory. But act two is where we add conflict. So this is the story of fat binary gems. We talked earlier about how there is a Ruby library for bcrypt called bcrypt Ruby. You can find it on uh, GitHub. I wanted to add a feature to bcrypt Ruby. So pulled it down, kind of tried to get up and running. But the test didn't run. And the dependencies were out of date and there were docs missing. So that one pull request turned into a dozen pull requests, and the next thing I know, I'm the new de facto maintainer of bcrypt Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was originally written by uh, Coda Hale. He's the third one. Uh, then it was taken over briefly, I believe, by Aaron, and then moved on to TMM1, Amon Gupta from uh, GitHub, and now, now it's me. <laughs> so, this is what bcrypt Ruby's source looks like. But more importantly, this is what bcrypt Ruby's source looks like. bcrypt Ruby is just a Ruby wrapper around a C extension and a Java extension. 
Uh, the reason this is, it could be implemented in pure Ruby, but Ruby has a uh, bad reputation for being slow, accurate, or otherwise, and C is always going to be fast, and you have to try to match your attacker, because your attacker will use the fastest implementation possible. So if you gave yourself an artificially low cost to match your slow implementation, that would be better for them. So that's why it is just wrapping a C library. But what that means is when you distribute a version of the gem, you have to distribute it with a compiled binary for the sake of your users so that they're not responsible for having a compiler on their system. And you can see there's four versions of each gem. So 315 at the top there. Uh, the fourth one is for the JVM. The third one is just a native one. And then the top two are both for Windows. The top one is for 32-bit, uh, and the second one is for 64-bit. And these are fat binary gems, which is this uh, notion of having it compiled against multiple versions of Ruby in the one package, which is useful for Windows. Luckily, when Amon added all of this to the bcrypt Ruby library, he left this awesome commit message of step-by-step -step how to do it. But he left that three years ago, and anything about computers on the internet that's three years old doesn't work. Aaron introduced the notion of fat binary gems about five years ago. Uh, first of all, he made the queen joke that I made five years before me. But second of all, anything about computers that's five years old on the internet definitely doesn't work. All of this, though, and particularly after Aaron's work, got wrapped up into a tool called uh, Rake Compiler. And Rake Compiler is a Rake task, or Rake tool, for building these uh, binary gems. So you can just do kind of rake build native and get a native one out, and rake build cross compile and get a cross compiled one out. And it has epic length docs that you can follow through and get everything up and running, and it didn't work. <laughs> so the Rails core team has this thing called the Rails dev box which is a virtual machine that inside has all of the native dependencies that you need to run the test suite that you might not have on your native machine or want to. So it has all of the databases you'll need, MySQL, Postgres, SQLite. It also has all the system dependencies you'll need, and it also has things like Node and Memcache that you might not be running locally. That's great. So I had a dream that I would create the rate compiler dev box a virtual machine that had all the Rubies I needed, the GCC, the JDK, uh, MinGW, which is a uh, a tool for compiling Windows binaries on Nix-like machines, which is kind of the bread and butter of this whole process. And Vagrant exists. And Vagrant does, it makes these lightweight, reproducible, and portable development environments exactly what we want. So I followed all the docs, I made, made this Vagrant box, and everything was just great and wonderful, and it didn't work. <laughs> so what do you do with anything that doesn't work? You put it on GitHub. And with that, I opened up Rake Compiler issue number 79. Uh, I pretty much said, listen, I followed the docs 10 times over at this point. Nothing really is working for me. What can I do? In our three-act play, this would be the climax, the turning point. And you were promised a love story. This is Luis Lavena. Luis is the developer of the one-click Ruby installer for Windows. Uh, because of that work, Luis is also a member on Ruby Core. Because of his work on both of those, he was voted a Ruby hero in 2010. But most importantly for us here today, he is the developer of Rake Compiler. And he is every uh, Ruby developer on Windows just best friend. He opened up Rake Compiler DevBox pull request number two, where in a very long, very detailed, very friendly thread, he dropped triple hearts on me, not once, not twice, <laughs> not three times, but four times. So here's the problem. I'm 12 hearts in the hole. <laughs> and I need you to help me pay him back. So everyone, take out your internet devices and open up Twitter and send a tweet to Luis with three hearts. Uh, pro tip, if you're on Mavericks or later on your Mac, you can hit uh, Control Command Space and get all the fancy emoji. I'll be here all day. I'll wait. Come on. Get on it. So. Luis is a great open source maintainer. If you follow anything he's done on the internet, he's very friendly and uh, very accepting and very helpful, even when he doesn't necessarily have to be. So to half of you, the half that are you know, just boots on the ground developers like me, I encourage you to find your Luis. Find someone that you can collaborate with to work on something interesting that you wouldn't otherwise. It could just be a coworker, or it could be someone else in the greater community. Um, 
And you, know, you can thank them for the work they do, but it's just much more interesting to work with them. Uh, Luis splits his time between Argentina and Paris, so it's a nice, fun global uh, collaboration. He's also a Harvest user, so that was a nice bonus. Uh, but to the other half of you, the half that are already maintaining these giant libraries and you know the pain that can come with being an open source maintainer, I want to encourage you to be the Luis that you want to see in the world and to, when that pull request comes in or that issue comes in, that's the same issue you've seen 100 times and you just want to say, RTFM noob, go away, consider that the problem might be the FM and try to be a little bit more helpful and realize that people are on the other end and open source is people. So what have we learned today? Number one, just use bcrypt. Just do it. If you're not already, talk to me afterwards. We'll hug, we'll cry, we'll convert our passwords. It will be great. Uh, number two, distribute a dev box. If you are doing something that has complicated dependencies, it will make it a lot easier for other people to use if you give them an easy way to have an environment. Um, additionally, if you develop a gem that has a C extension or a Java extension, consider using rate compiler dev box. It makes it a lot easier. But most importantly, number three, I want to encourage you to release, to collaborate, and to iterate. Thank you very much.